afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to what I believe is the last concurrent session of a, what has been a wonderful conference. I mean, we are really honored that not only to have these three wonderful uh, scholars, but that to, I can't think of a better way to end a conference on the Catholic imagination than to talk about O'Connor. So um, without further ado, uh, I will introduce each speaker, on, and I, we're just going to wait for the Q&A at the end after all three have, have spoken. Can you all hear this OK? OK. A little louder. So our first uh, scholar is Jill Pelez, is that correct? <laughs> Jill Pelez <laughs> Baumgartner. She's the author of five collections of poetry, a textbook anthology, poetry, and Flannery O'Connor, A Proper Scaring, in addition to over 40 essays. She has also edited the poetry anthology, Imagio Dei. She has been a Fulbright scholar and is the winner of several poetry awards. She is professor of English Emerita and former Dean of Humanities and Theological Studies at Wheaton College. She currently serves as poetry editor of the Christian Century. So thank you. Can you hear me? Is that good? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. It is a delight to be on this panel with two of my favorite people, Angela, who is an inspiration in her poetry and her uh, work on Flannery O'Connor, and my new friend, Christine Flanagan. Um, I discovered her last year uh, as I was asked to review a, her book on her collection of letters. And I tell you what, go out and buy it. It is revelatory. Um, it really is. It's, it's a very special, special thing. So here I am talking about Flannery O'Connor's prayer journal. The questions that I would like to address in this short time are these. Why did Flannery O'Connor abandon her prayer journal after a little over a year and a half? What realization did she come to that caused her to cut the journal off abruptly? What does she reveal as the primary struggle for the writer of faith? And what can creative writers of faith take away with them from O'Connor's experience? To begin with, what exactly would provoke a young woman to begin to keep a journal to God? A strong tradition of spiritual journaling, of course, exists in the church. St. Therese of Lisieux, Ignatius Loyola, Teresa of Avila. Many of the mystics kept journals. And it is probably no coincidence that O'Connor writes in one of her last entries in, the, in her prayer journal, I would like to be a mystic and immediately. <laughs> she had hundreds of models for this. So O'Connor embarked on this project seeking, I believe, what she thought might be important in religious experience. The journal itself reveals her motives. It seems that O'Connor had indeed achieved what she labeled intelligent holiness, but she constantly felt that an ingredient was missing. And what was that ingredient? Selflessness? That would be particularly difficult to achieve in a personal journal. A more intimate connection with God? That certainly could be a motivation. Dear God, she writes, please help me to be an artist Please let it lead to you. This was not the first time she had attempted a journal. In another journal, which O'Connor kept for 40 days while she was a junior in college, and which Image Magazine published a couple of years ago, O'Connor writes at one point, Dear God, let me expand my capacity for the feeling of thee. In the prayer journal we are considering today, which she began two years later when she was in graduate school at the University of Iowa, she picks up the theme again. I do not mean to deny the traditional prayers I have said all my life, but I've been saying them and not feeling them, she writes in her first entry. The journal was her attempt to stir up feeling and to keep it alive, that is to feel closeness to God, 
and to bask in it. The plea comes up over and over again. Perhaps the feeling I keep asking for is something again selfish, she writes. I don't want to be doomed to mediocrity in my feeling for Christ. I want to feel, she pleads again. The journal ends abruptly when she once again complains of her distance from God. My thoughts are so far away from God, he might as well not have made me. And the feeling I egg up writing here lasts approximately a half hour and seems a sham. A lesser writer, thinker, and a truly mediocre believer. Um, her greatest fear was that she was actually a mediocre believer would probably have drifted off into despair at this realization. But O'Connor clearly lived a faith life and an artistic life that transcended these early cries of futility. At the age of 21, with only 18 more years of life ahead, she seems to have reached a conclusion that she explores later in her numerous letters to Betty Hester. We Catholics don't believe grace is something you have to feel, she says later. There is a question whether faith can or is supposed to be emotionally satisfying. I must say that the thought of everyone lolling about in an emotionally satisfying faith is repugnant to me. <laughs> I believe that we are ultimately directed Godward, but that this journey is often impeded by emotion. So she turns abruptly away from this desire to stir up spiritual and devotional feelings. The journal does not work for her that way. And in fact, her faith, she realized in the writing of this journal, was not dependent on emotion. After all, emotions cannot be trusted. She wrote later, we Catholics don't believe grace is something you have to feel. The Catholic always distrust his emotional reaction to the sacraments. Many have commented that there is not one shred of sentimentality in O'Connor's writing, and we see the development of that propensity in the final entry in the journal as she says, I don't want any of this artificial, superficial feeling stimulated by the choir. While O'Connor continued to write prose that was not fiction, letters, essays, book reviews, so far as we know, she never again wrote a diary to God, and the prayers she offers later to friends and her correspondence are often the established prayers of the church. She shed the sham, as she called it, and returned to established forms, quite unlike what she did in her fiction, which is certainly, at least in its content, surprising, humorous, peculiar, violent, utterly original, utterly unsentimentally, uh, unsentimental, and emotionally and spiritually jarring. She wrote wake-up calls for all of us. But there are those who don't entirely get it when they read O'Connor. The introduction to this slim volume written by W.A. Sessions, one of O'Connor's friends, reveals the penchant by some scholars and some of her biographers to minimize, that doesn't count Angela among them, to minimize the faith aspects of O'Connor's work as an idiosyncrasy that must be tolerated in order to get through to the artistry and the humor. For Sessions, the experience of faith seems oddly distant. He writes of O'Connor's early life in Savannah as being permeated with a, a series, I quote him, a series of Catholic rituals and teachings. One cannot argue with this conclusion, mechanistic as it is, but it omits entirely any place for devotion and mystery, which O'Connor vociferously claimed was essential for any Catholic artist. Later, Sessions uses dismissive quotation marks as he comments, she would have to wait patiently in a world of triviality with the Lord's until the Lord's response came. For O'Connor, the Lord was not a vague, vague concept to be treated ironically in scare quotes. The Lord and his mother were lifeblood itself, as is also evident in the journal. I believe the lesson here is that if you are a writer of faith and attempting to write fiction or poetry or creative nonfiction integrated with your faith, you can pretty well count on even some of your best friends not understanding your work. Unfortunately, the audience with ears to hear and eyes to see is becoming smaller all the time. O'Connor, of course, knew this, and how did she deal with it? She dealt with it directly and boldly. She did not flinch. <laughs> 
but neither did she preach. If she had preached in her fiction, her audience would have fled. But she also knew that the writer who is thoroughly Christian will be unable to write anything without in some way revealing God. In Catholic novelist and their readers, O'Connor says, the novelist doesn't write to express himself. He doesn't write strongly to render a vision he believes true. Rather, he renders his vision so that it can be transferred as nearly whole as possible to his reader. The sorry religious novel comes about when the writer supposes that because of his belief, he is somehow dispensed from the obligation to penetrate concrete reality. O'Connor was not usually a journal writer, writing to express herself, writing to render a vision she believed true. She was a novelist who wanted her vision to be given to the reader through her use of concrete reality. Journal writing turned out to be not her thing. O'Connor tore several pages out of both her college journal and this later journal. Why would she do that? Probably because she had written things that were too personal, or other things she was ashamed of, of saying about people or situations. O'Connor was certainly a letter writer, but letters to God require introspection and confession, different from letters to friends. In the first entry to this journal, she writes, Dear God, I cannot love thee the way I want to. You are the slim crescent of a moon that I see, and myself is the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon. The crescent is very beautiful, and perhaps that is all one like I am should or could see. But what I am afraid of, dear God, is that my self-shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon and that I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me to push myself aside. O'Connor realizes what so many writers of our time do not. In writing as in loving God, the writer or the prayer must get out of the way enough to hear God, to pay attention to where the muse, the Holy Spirit, is leading. Which brings us to another insight we can glean about O'Connor from this journal. She, like the 17th century poet George Herbert, bounces between pride and humility, wanting to do her best work, confident that her work is worthy, and then drawing back and wondering if it is actually mediocre. She writes, please let Christian principles permeate my writing and please let there be enough of my writing published for Christian principles to permeate. <laughs> Another time she says, oh dear God, I want to write a novel, a good novel. I want to do this for a good feeling and for a bad one. The bad one is uppermost. <laughs> The psychologists say it is the natural one. Let me get away, dear God, from all things thus natural. Help me to get what is more than natural into my work. Help me to love and hear with my work on that account. If I have to sweat for it, dear God, let it be at your service. I would like to be intelligently holy. I am a presumptuous fool, but maybe the vague thing in me that keeps me in is hope. Another time she writes, how can I live? How shall I live? Obviously, the only way to live right is to give up everything. But I have no vocation, and maybe that is wrong anyway, but how to eliminate this picky fishbone kind of way I do things? I want so to love God all the way. At the same time, I want all the things that seem opposed to it. I want to be a fine writer. Any success will tend to swell my head, unconsciously even, if ever do I do get to be a fine writer, it will not be because I am a fine writer, but because God has given me credit for a few of the things he kindly wrote for me. <laughs> right at present, this does not seem to be his policy. <laughs> this is difficult for anyone in any line of work, doing one's very best, creating something excellent, and at the same time, getting oneself out of the way. This applies not only to writing, but I have found also to teaching, to poetry writing, to poetry editing, to being an administrator, to living in the world. So what can we as creative writers of faith extrapolate and take away from O'Connor's experience? First of all, 
Evoking feeling through our writing is not so important as evoking interest. Forcing our readers to pay attention, presenting our readers with experience, which of course can involve and lead to feeling, but we run the risk of being manipulative if we rely too much on trying to stir up feeling in our reader. And isn't that excess of feeling really sentimentality? Second, expect to be misunderstood by well-meaning readers. That includes friends and that includes critics. O'Connor once said to William Sessions, Billy, recover your simplicity. Third, the most difficult of all, strive for excellence but stay humble, get yourself out of the way. As George Herbert writes in Jordan 2, in his early verse, he sought out quaint words, curling with metaphors, a plain intention. He says he weaved myself into the sense, and then he realized how pretentious. There is in love a sweetness ready penned. O'Connor says, when a view of love is present, a broad enough view, no more need be no more need be added to make the world view. And that is the most important. Love. Think of O'Connor's stories. We have precious few examples of human love in her stories, even though we always feel that she loves her characters, crazy and sinful though they might be. But one dramatic example is in the character of Raber in The Violent Bear It Away. He is involved in an internal battle. He is a rationalist fighting against the irrational love he has for his mentally disabled child. And I'm quoting now from the book. The little boy's white head fitted under his chin. Above it, Raber looked at nothing in particular. Then he closed his eyes. Without warning, his hated love gripped him and held him in a vice. He should have known better than to let the child into his lap. His forehead became beady with sweat. He looked as if he might have been nailed to the bench. He knew that if he could once conquer this pain, face it, and with a supreme effort of his will, refuse to feel it, he would be a free man. He is, of course, completely wrong, and O'Connor makes that clear. So O'Connor does not jettison feeling as a means of grace. But I think that what she re realized in writing this prayer journal was that seeking devotional feeling was an artificial process. Instead, it is the indirection of art that led her most directly to God. Thank you. Thank you. Moving now from um, the prayer journal to O'Connor's letters, it's my honor to introduce Angela O'Donnell, who is the Associate Director of Fordham University's Curran Center for American Catholic Studies and teaches courses in English and in American Catholic Studies. As many of you know, she has published five collections of poems. She's also the author of The Province of Joy, a book of hours based on the prayer life of Flannery O'Connor, Mortal Blessings, a memoir and meditation everyday sacraments, and Flannery O'Connor, Fiction Fired by Faith, a critical biography and introduction to O'Connor's work. And she's currently working on two books, uh, also on O'Connor, um, due in the spring of 2020, a critical study of Flannery O'Connor and on the subject of race, and Andalusian Hours, a collection of 101 sonnets that channel the voice of Flannery O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you, um, and uh, I am delighted to be here and be on this panel with two of my favorite people also. <laughs> um, we have a mutual admiration society, obviously, those of us who love O'Connor. That's the one thing in common that we share. Um, I'm also going to be speaking about the, um, uh, about the prayer journal, so you may hear some of the same passages that Jill just quoted, but what's he worth hearing once is certainly worth hearing twice, especially if Flannery wrote it. Uh, so I don't think anybody will mind too much. Uh, and this, this essay is called The Epistolary Flannery. Dear God, I cannot love thee the way I want to. You are the slim crescent of a moon that I see, and myself is the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon. The crescent is very beautiful, 
and perhaps that is all one like I am, should or could see. But what I am afraid of, dear God, is that my self-shadow will grow so large that I block the whole moon, and that I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me to push myself aside. These remarkable words written by Flannery O'Connor in January of 1946, when she was an MFA student at Iowa, capture the spiritual agon that the young writer was engaged in as she struggled to discover the connection between her vocation as a writer and her vocation as a Catholic. Located among her papers by William Sessions, who was a friend of O'Connor's, the Prayer Journal was published to great acclaim in 2013. Many of us in the room probably remember when it came out as it gave readers a glimpse into the baptism by fire that she had to undergo as America's finest Catholic writer of the 20th century. Six years later, the Prayer Journal continues to appeal to readers of all stamps, from the literary scholar to the casual reader, so it teaches us, as it teaches us not only about the author, but also about, about ourselves as people in pursuit of twin vocations, the professional and the spiritual, and the challenges of reconciling the two. I had the occasion to visit the Prayer Journal recently in connection with, well, actually, I was invited to by Jill <laughs> uh, for a conference that we were going to, and I was really pleased to discover that the pages of her journal are as poignant and profound as when I first read them in 2013. Many of the passages are familiar, and yet this encounter yielded fresh discoveries. What strikes me this time around is the way in which writing the journal helped O'Connor to grow, not only in her faith, but also in her art. O'Connor's prayer journal played a crucial role in enabling a fledgling writer experiment with and discover her literary vocation and her voice. The entries in the prayer journal beginning in January 40, 1946 and concluding in September 1947 take the form of letters, or at least most of them do a genre O'Connor would eventually master after she is diagnosed with lupus and exiled to her mother's farm in rural Georgia for the last 13 years of her life, the period during which letters would become her primary means of communication with the outside world. These mature letters, wherein the full range of O'Connor's personality is on display, were eventually published as The Habit of Being, of course, a volume which we all know and love, and constitutes one of the finest collections of correspondence ever produced by a writer. The only one rivaled by it, in my estimation, is, is Keats's letters. There's ample evidence in O'Connor's papers that she enjoyed letter writing from an early age and took some pride in her skill. In an earlier journal O'Connor kept in college, humorous, humorously mistitled Higher Ath Mathematics, and recently found among her papers, she writes, my epistolary powers enthrall me. It is a pity I can't receive my own letters. <laughs> if they produce as much wholehearted approval at their destination as they do at their source, they should indeed be able to keep my memory alive and healthy. She writes that in 1944, January 22nd. Clearly, O'Connor enjoyed the particular challenges and rewards of the genre and would continue to hone her skill. Her early letters are, in some ways, apprentice pieces, preparation for the mature letters she would write, and also eventually practice for her fiction. The epistolary element of the prayer journal in particular provided her with an opportunity to write letters of a different nature from any she had ever written before. Her letters in the journal are, after all, letters to God, opening up an avenue for communication about matters of the soul and making them much more frank and intimate than those she might have penned to ordinary people. These letters functioned in a variety of ways, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'd like to focus on three. First, they gave her the chance to explore her most private thoughts and feelings without exposing herself or her work to judgment or to censure, something that she endured on a daily basis as a member of the workshop. Unlike her fiction, which she hoped would be read by many people, her letters to God would remain sealed and secret, as private as prayer. This gives O'Connor the freedom as a writer to address her greatest spiritual challenges and her besetting sins, and among these are the twin torments of fear and desire. As the quotation that I opened with would suggest, one of her primary fears is that of the self and its relentless demands. She also fears the tyranny of her own intellect, the loss of her faith, and literary and spiritual mediocrity. 
But more than fear, these letters are the records of desire. O'Connor writes at one point in her letters to God that supplication is the only one of the four kinds of prayer that she is any good at. She desires many things, among them grace, the knowledge of what is good, and a revolution of the heart, believing hers to be corrupt. But what she desires most of all is to be a good writer. Dear God, I am so discouraged about my work. I have the feeling of discouragement that is, I realize, I don't know what I realize. Please help me, dear God, to be a good writer and to get something accepted. That is so far from what I deserve, of course, that I am naturally struck with the nerve of it. And then she says a little later, I want to be the best artist that is possible to be under God. Dear God, please help me to be an artist. Please let it lead me to you. And then she says in another letter, Dear God, tonight it is not disappointing because you have given me a story. Don't let me ever think, dear God, that I was anything but the instrument for your story, just like the typewriter was for mine. In these passages, we see O'Connor's desire to be a good and famous writer, in tension with her fear of her own pride and egotism. O'Connor knows she is smart and is very much taken with her own intellect and cleverness. She confesses in another letter to God, after making a joke in the midst of her prayer, her sense of humor forever getting the best of her, both in her stories and her letters, she writes, I do not mean to be clever, although I do mean to be clever on second thought, <laughs> and I like to be clever, and I want to be considered so. Though she knows the danger of intellectual pride, like the young girl in her story, The Temple of the Holy Ghost, whose character is essentially a self-portrait, she cannot help but indulge in it and worries about its spiritual consequences. Thus, desire and fear grapple with one another as O'Connor's psychomachia works itself out on the page. And even as the contest takes place, by engaging in it, she is becoming a more practiced writer. A second purpose served by the letters is that they filled a void at a time in her life when she found herself a stranger in a strange land, living and writing among people who did not share her faith, in her second entry in the prayer journal, she writes, I dread, O oh Lord, losing my faith. My mind is not strong. It is a prey to all sorts of intellectual quackery. When O'Connor went to Iowa, she found herself for the first time in her life surrounded almost entirely by people who did not believe. Far from her devout mother and her large extended Catholic family, cut off from a community of practicing believers, O'Connor struggled with doubt and feared she was not strong enough to withstand the assault made on her faith by her writer colleagues and secular university culture. Writing her letters to God provided her with a new avenue of prayer, something she desperately needs, because in her words, quote, I've been saying the traditional prayers I have said all my life, but not feeling them. Engaging with this colloquy with God, however, she says, I can feel the warmth of love heating me when I think and write this to you. God then becomes a familiar, a friend and a confidant, rather than a distant powerful force who can be approached only through the sanctioned means and methods. O'Connor is charting unknown territory in inventing these, pro these prayers, something Catholics of her era were not encouraged to do, and for a while at least she revels in the experience. Finally, a third opportunity afforded to her by the letters was to give her the, ch the rare chance to write from the first person perspective something she did not do in her fiction, and to discover how to create a persona. While it's true that O'Connor attempts to be her unvarnished self in her letters to God, she is also creating a construct of herself. There is a self-consciousness at work here, which comes out in ways both obvious and subtle. As William Sessions notes in his introduction, these letters are spontaneous, but they're also revised, help betraying the element of conscious craft in her writing. They are literary experiments, something O'Connor acknowledges at various times. In one of her letters, about halfway through the journal, she writes, quote, I've decided this is not much as a direct medium of prayer. Prayer is not as premeditated as, uh, as this. It is of the moment, and this is too slow for the moment. In the very last entry, she admits that the experiment in communing with God hasn't worked. Quote, my thoughts are so, so far away from God, he w might as well not have made me. And the feeling I egg up writing here lasts approximately a half hour and seems a sham. 
The very quality of this form of prayer she enjoyed so much at first, the feeling it engendered, she now begins to distrust for all of the reasons that she'll just uh, outline so well. In the battle between her intellect and her heart, her intellect gets the upper hand. This is very much in keeping with ideas about prayer and worship O'Connor expresses in her mature letters, wherein she confesses a wariness of religious observance that appeals to and relies primarily on emotion. O'Connor's prayer experiment may have proved a failure in her eyes, but it was a great success seen from another vantage point. In creating and inhabiting the various, various personae that she creates, angry flannery, frustrated flannery, remorseful flannery, grateful flannery, prideful flannery, she was engaging in what Henry James once called the histrionic imagination and was effectively training herself for her work as a fiction writer. She was practicing empathy, a virtue that did not come naturally to O'Connor. <laughs> the cultivation of the ability to see and describe the world from these varying perspectives would enable her to create characters who were as different from herself as chickens from peacocks. It would enable her to become the racist Ruby Turpin she depicts in Revelation, O.E. Parker, the man obsessed with tattoos and Parker's back, a selfish old grandmother, and a sensitive serial killer in A Good Man is Hard to Find. These acts of imagination make O'Connor's writing essentially dramatic, something true of both the prayer journal and her fiction. It's not for nothing that Thomas Merton, on hearing of her death, compared her to Sophocles, a great dramatist, rather than another fiction writer. As she depicted the elemental human struggle between characters who were grand and yet ordinary, true to life, and somehow larger than life, which we saw so beautifully on the stage last night for those of you who went to the play or this afternoon. In one of his letters, the poet John Keats speaks of the two great models of the artistic imagination in comparing what he calls the chameleon poet, represented by Shakespeare, and the egotistical sublime, the kind of poetry pioneered by Wordsworth. Keats aspires to the condition of the chameleon poet, envying Shakespeare's ability to become his characters so thoroughly that he himself disappeared, but he had difficulty in accomplishing this. Keats's best poems are those that, like Wordsworth, focus on himself. But O'Connor was able to do this, achieving the ability to occupy the condition of the other. And paradoxically, she achieved this in part through writing letters to God, which might seem to be exercises in the egotistical sublime, but serve ultimately to teach her how to transcend the self, or, alternate, or, or alternately to write about the self through her characters. Quote, she says, is there no escape from ourselves into something bigger she asks this in one of these journal entries, and the answer provided by her fiction is, yes. In one of her letters to a friend, O'Connor speaks about one of her early stories that she wrote at Iowa, The Geranium. It's about an old Southerner who goes to live in the alien environment of New York City and finds himself miserably homesick for the world he left behind. O'Connor admits that at the time, she knew nothing about New York City, but she did know something about homesickness. And since she couldn't write about herself, the old man named Dudley serves as a kind of double for her. O'Connor wrote the geranium around the same time she was writing her letters to God, and the imaginative work she did in composing them helped her to accomplish this. As we know, O'Connor eventually stopped writing the journal after nearly two years of keeping it. And one reason she does this is that it has served its purpose. She doesn't need it anymore. It is instructed that the first words of the journal express her distrust of the self. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. And the last words of the journals are these. There is nothing left to say of me. All that needed to be said of young Flannery O'Connor had been said, and it was time to turn her full attention to her characters, to pour herself into them and to make them come alive. The fact that O'Connor's journal is a form of literary experimentation does not make them any less genuine. This is, after all, what writers do, find ways to use language that lead to a fuller understanding of our inner and outer weather, as Robert Frost puts it, the ways in which the self is related to the physical world and the spiritual cosmos we inhabit. She moves from the practice of praise, petition, and thanksgiving to interrogation and self-castigation employing a variety of voices and rhetorical modes to arrive at a better understanding of God, herself, and her vocation. 
Ultimately, writing her letters to God leads to self-revelation, wherein, wherein she faces aspects of herself that she would rather not. And though O'Connor may seem to conclude on a dark note, there is nothing left to say of me, I believe that discovery actually brings her a sense of relief and gives her permission to move on with her true vocation, the business of writing fiction. Prayer is what Catholics do, and O'Connor prayed in every way she could find, in church, by her bedside, in her journal, and in her stories, all of which avenues gave her access to the God she so fervently sought and blessedly was able to find. I'd like to conclude this meditation on O'Connor's letters to God with a meditation of my own, a poem that might shed some further light on the spiritual battle she engaged in so passionately when she was a student at, student at Iowa. The poem channels the voice of Flannery O'Connor. It's one of, as was just mentioned, 101. <laughs> and it takes its epigraph from her journal. It's one of the final entries and is very much in keeping with O'Connor's personality, embracing both the poignant and the absurd, the ridiculous and the sublime, something she was able to do so masterfully in her fiction and in her letters. The poem attempts to elaborate on her words and imagines what young Flannery might have been thinking when she was a student at Iowa penning the pages of her prayer journal. It's called Flannery's Prayer, and the epigraph, oops, the epigraph is, what I am asking for is really very ridiculous. Oh Lord, I am saying at present, I am a cheese. Make me a mystic immediately. Sometimes I tire of waiting for the transformation the moment I move from milk product to holy hallelujah, halo on my head instead of rind, my smell suddenly sweet instead of sour, a rose growing amid the dairy farm of life. My mama and my proper Catholic aunts pray for rain, good weather. Won't they be surprised to learn what their odd daughter hankers for? Wisdom to light on me like a pet bird pecking its feed from my open hand. Vision that penetrates walls and doors that shut me up and away from your love, the stuff that cheeses like me dream of. Thank you. Staying within the world of O'Connor's letters, I'd like to introduce Christine Flanagan. She's the editor of the Letters of Flannery O'Connor and Carolyn Gordon, and a recipient of the 2017 Lindbach Distinguished Teaching Award. Flanagan's essays and fiction have garnered three Pushcart Prize nominations, and her plays have been produced in New York and Portland, Oregon. Flanagan is currently a professor of English at the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. Thank you. Let's see what we can do here. So, um, Carolyn, Carolyn Gordon was the answer <clears throat> to Flannery's prayers. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, there's my book. Yeah. I think Carolyn Gordon was the answer to um, Flannery O'Connor's prayers. Um, I teach creative writing, and I teach a couple of textbooks all the time. And by the way, I hope there are writers in the audience, because uh, this is a talk for writers. Um, I teach John Gardner's The Art of Fiction. I teach Janet Burroway's Writing Fiction. And now I teach the letters of Flannery O'Connor and Carolyn Gordon. So today I'd just like to talk about these letters as a master class in the art of writing fiction. Uh, you all know Flannery O'Connor. Uh, in 1951, when Flannery O'Connor was 26, Caroline Gordon read a near final draft of her first novel, Wise Blood, and provided O'Connor with detailed feedback. Gordon's first impression, she is already a rare phenomenon, a Catholic novelist with a real dramatic sense one who relies more on her technique than her piety. Gordon and O'Connor correspond for 13 years from 1951 through O'Connor's death in 1964. And as her friendship with O'Connor deepened, many people aren't familiar with Carolyn Gordon, so I like to give a little intro to her. 
But as her friendship with O'Connor deepened, Gordon was at the height of her career. Caroline Gordon had converted to Catholicism, had completed eight novels and one short story collection, had earned a National Book Award nomination alongside authors William Faulkner, Truman Capote, and J.D. Salinger. There's Caroline. She had won a Guggenheim Award. Maxwell Perkins, editor of Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Wolfe, had been Gordon's editor for the last 20 years before his death. Early in their friendship, Caroline Gordon wrote a book called How to Read a Novel, and this was actually just reissued um, this year. Um, Caroline Gordon writes in it, when we are tempted to censure an author because the characters in his novels do not adhere to our own code of morals, we ought to remind ourselves that some of the greatest heroes of fiction, indeed of myth and legend, trespassed against the accepted code of their days. The reader who demands that his own moral code shall not be infringed upon or his feelings lacerated by any unpleasant happenings in any book he reads is like a person who prefers to picnic at the foot of a mountain and forgo the view he would get from the summit rather than undergo the rigors of the climb to the top. If we spend all our time picnicking in the valley, we may come to feel that there is nothing worth seeing outside of it, may be tempted to dismiss as vain imaginings the wonders that our more energetic friends tell us they have viewed from the mountaintop. I read that long quote because um, Flannery O'Connor reads this book. She actually has an unpublished, um, now published in my book, a book review of Carolyn Gordon's um, book, How to Read a Novel. And Flannery O'Connor um, reads this book the year she's writing um, one of her most anthologized short stories, A Good Man is Hard to Find. And it turns out this is one of the short stories that the two women corresponded about. Uh, in this story, if you're not familiar, or if you need a little reminder, um, here we go, you'll remember it. A family from Georgia heads off on a journey, takes a wrong turn, has a car accident, comes face to face with the misfit, a criminal who's gotten a loose from the federal penitentiary with his cronies. The entire family, two young children, the mother and the father, the main character, the grandmother, are murdered, shot in the woods on the side of a dirt road, and the grandmother has an extended conversation with the misfit as the other characters are taken off stage to be killed one by one. Alice Walker captures a common reader's confusion with this story. It has puzzled some of her readers and annoyed the Catholic Church that in her stories, O'Connor's stories, not only does good not triumph, it is not usually present. But O'Connor's work would never puzzle Carolyn Gordon. To show you one example of this masterclass in action, um, and to simplify things, I wanna show you a little bit about how Carolyn Gordon helped O'Connor revise. Uh, to simplify, I'm gonna read Gordon's suggestions from the letters, and then I have passages from the book highlighted where O'Connor has revised these things. So uh, Carolyn Gordon sees an early draft of A Good Man is Hard to Find, and she writes to O'Connor, the story, and here you go, writers, take notes. <laughs> this is the stuff I teach to my students. I love it. The story on the whole does not have enough composition of scene, she says, to borrow a phrase from St. Ignatius of Loyola. It is not well enough located in time and place. Remember that the Lord made the world before he made Adam and Eve. I particularly miss landscape after the misfit comes on the scene. If I were doing it, Gordon tells O'Connor, I'd show the grandmother's reactions to what is happening or what she barely suspects may happen by the way the world, these trees, this road looks to her. Then have her resolutely concentrate on her talk with the man, the misfit. I'd work this device three times, I think, when um, Bailey, the grandmother's son, uh, first goes off, then when the shot comes when he's killed, and then when the second shot comes when the others are killed. O'Connor takes uh, Gordon's suggestions. And you can see in the, in the text where O'Connor layers in these um, bits of landscape 
another suggestion of Gordon's. One wonders how the grandmother is able to keep her mind on her conversation with the misfit when her son goes off in the woods. I think she ought to register Bailey's going and bringing herself back to the misfit in an effort. Even if Bailey doesn't resist, doesn't fight back, I think we ought to know the attitude his body assumed as he went off. Uh, right before he goes off then into the woods. And then back throughout the story, there's this um, composition of scene. Um, again, Gordon saying events take place in time and space to use landscape. The success of this story relies heavily on point of view, particularly at the end. How can O'Connor sustain a believable character in the grandmother as the rest of the family is walked off into the woods and killed? Gordon tells O'Connor, there's one little trick. I think you need it. And I think perhaps the best way to put it before you is to tell you something about my novel, The Strange Children. My heroine is nine years old, and this is the narrator of Gordon's novel. Every event in the action is reflected by nine-year-old Lucy. Henry James said himself that you had to have a character who was capable of morally evaluating what happened to him. I could not have written my book, though, without this little hint. It's Percy Lubbock, one of her, one of her favorite writers. Um, this little hint. Sometimes the recording intelligence records more dramatically when it does not know what it is recording. Gordon's nine-year-old character sees and records um, seeing a man and a woman with no interpretation whatsoever. And the reader realizes what the young girl doesn't, that this is an affair. So Gordon continues, I think that this little trick, the consciousness recording something it doesn't understand, children often do that, would be very helpful to you. I feel that your grandmother ought to record the fact that something is happening or going to happen without understanding it. She's just the kind of character who's made for this device. And sure enough, we the reader hear the gunshots as family member after family member is killed off stage. The grandmother sits and tries to communicate with the misfit in this ridiculous childlike way, but she's unable to fully register what's happening while we, the reader, understand the horror completely. Um, I'll just end with this. In the art of fiction, writer John Gardner challenges writers to exercise empathy what he calls sanity, and I love that, um, equating empathy with sanity. The writer who never cheats in writing, Gardner says, is one who never forgets that he is writing about people, so that to turn characters to cartoons or to treat his characters as innately inferior to himself is bad art. Even in her earliest critiques of wise blood, Gordon continually guided O'Connor away from bad art. Others might call O'Connor's character's grotesque. But Gordon reminds O'Connor when giving feedback on Wise Blood, here are three young people trying to do the best they can. Sabbath wants to get married. Enoch wants to live a normal human life. Hayes, who is a prophet and a poet, wants to live his life out on a higher level. And as for Sabbath, Gordon suggested, I think it would be a more dramatic if you were a little more compassionate toward her. In... Um, in 1964, the year O'Connor died, Gordon delivered one of her favorite lectures titled The Shape of the River, and it, it remains unpublished. It's one of her best pieces of writing, I think. There is one necessity which we all face, she said in this talk, more or less intermittently, confrontation with the ineffable, that thing which is larger than life and so mysterious that we can find no words to express our apprehension of it. The young man or woman, Gordon said, who aspires to write fiction professionally has a hard and dangerous voyage before him. 
It seems to me that if he has been properly instructed in the Catholic faith, he has an advantage over navigators who have to discover the shape of the river for themselves. This knowledge, the knowledge of the shape of the river, by day or night, in fog, in mist, going up the river or coming down, will stand him in better stead on this voyage than any other knowledge he can acquire. So I hope that small snapshot um, helps you see a little bit of how Carolyn Gordon helped O'Connor uh, write um, so powerful, um, so potent. Um, and I do think she was the answer to O'Connor's prayers. So thank you. So we have a mic. Um, I don't know what I'm doing with that. Uh, so we have a mic, a mic that can go around the room. Um, I, I would prefer uh, if, that to let you all do the Q and A before me. I have some questions if no one has anything to answer or to ask. But I think you all have probably more interesting things to ask than I do. So yes, we have one right back here. Um, Carolyn, so I have a question um, for uh, Christine Flanagan. Um, I read your book, um, or the, the collection of letters, and I loved it. Um, and I think one of the things that was so striking to me about it was it was just so cool to read these two like, crazy smart Catholic women having these discussions about writing, about fiction, and just to hear kind of like what they were thinking. Um, and one thing that I found really surprising was just how much, Car like, how much feedback Caroline Gordon gave, like especially um, on the Enduring Chill she came up with some changes that are really major and like are some of my favorite parts of that story. It's, that's my favorite story. Um, so I think sometimes with women writers, we tend to like imagine they just sort of came out of nowhere. Um, sometimes we forget the communities they came out of. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of like, would we have the Flannery O'Connor that we, that we did have without Caroline Gordon? Like who would Flannery O'Connor have been without her? What would the stories have been without Caroline Gordon? Yeah, I say no. And I say also that does not diminish O'Connor's achievement. Um, Caroline Gordon was no joke. She was teaching at Columbia University. I write in my introduction to the book, she taught at over 20 different colleges and universities. She, um, you know, she was around writers all the time. When she first met O'Connor, I was just at the Walker Percy panel she had, um, her first letter to O'Connor in my book is like nine single spaced pages. Her first letter to Walker Percy written the same month is twice as long and contains much of the same advice. Um, but she did this for writers all the time, not just O'Connor. And in fact, at the end of Gordon's life, she was a little confused, like, why am I so famous for this? She, she gave this kind of feedback to writers all the time. But um, I too, I mean, that's why I did this book. I just found it unbelievable that this exchange could go on between people and that we had not known about it. So thank you. I'm glad you liked the book too. Could I add a bit to that? I, I had the sense in reading Christine's book, um, I realized after years of teaching and writing about Flannery O'Connor that I didn't have any sense that there was anyone behind her or next to her helping her along. And this was, that's when I use the word revelatory, I, I mean it. It really was quite remarkable. And I agree with you that enduring chill would not be the same story. And uh, just to add, to, to put this in the larger context, so many of the books, great books we know, would not be the books that they are without a community of writers who are helping. When F. Scott Fitzgerald read the version of The Sun Also Rises that Hemingway gave him, he said, no, you have to cut out this whole first section and you have to start with this. And Hemingway did it. Yeah. Or when Thomas Wolfe um, would send his work to Maxwell Perkins and Maxwell Perkins shaped these huge, monstrous <laughs> tomes into, into literature. So um, great editors are so necessary.
And many of us, of course, toil in obscurity and by ourselves, but it really does help to have, if you can find a Caroline Gordon, it's, <laughs> it's a really wonderful thing. I have your book, Christine. I have to admit, uh, I'm going to confess, I haven't read it yet, but it's uh, it's it's on my. On your... Okay, there you go. <laughs> but I do, but I do have it. And I was th when I was listening to you talk, and I and my own little my own bit of research with with O'Connor and Gordon, um, not as good, not as deep as yours. Um, I was thinking about it in terms of Paul Eli's uh, kind of sense of Gordon and both Percy and O'Connor, and how. Um, he kind of he's in the, in the room. Another confession. All right, no. Um, that, that she almost goes on the goes off on the deep end with the kind of the Catholic novel and the sense that um, again I'm kind of putting words into Paul's language, but that she was almost that finally kind of was kind of distancing herself a bit, uh, certainly at the end of this, this long epistolary relationship because she just, she just said no. I think that's that's not what the good Catholic novel is going to be, or that's not you know. And I was wondering, having really delve deep into it. How do you read that, that, that sense of was Caroline Gordon, she, she was so obsessed with the great Catholic novel and the great Catholic writer that in some ways uh, her own desire to make Flannery O'Connor or Walker Percy become that almost took over, so. Um, I have so many thoughts about that. Um, so the last um, thing O'Connor worked on was Parker's Back and she sent it to Catherine Carver, was it? And Catherine Carver was the one who said Ruby Turpin was the, had a heart that was black or all evil or something like that. And um, I'm trying to remember if O'Connor had one other person read it and the, they misinterpreted it and O'Connor sent it to Gordon. So even at the end, O'Connor knew despite personal characterization, you know, they were never, I say in my introduction, they weren't friends, they weren't like mother and sister, you know, mother, daughter, or sisters, they just didn't have a relationship I can neatly identify. But even at the end, when she got advice about her writing that was lacking, O'Connor still sent it back to Gordon. So, um, And at the same time, O'Connor is aware that Gordon is having a lot of trouble. She, um, she is mentally, <laughs> physically, really having a lot of difficulty. So. Did they ever meet in person? That's a great question. So over uh, the period of 13 years when they exchange letters, they only saw one another eight times in person. And sometimes that was a quick hello. Carolyn Gordon popped in before Flannery went to Lourdes, um, flew off through New York City, and sometimes it was a weekend conference, but only eight times over 13 years. Yeah. Was the first time the Janies, was that the first time they met? First time was with the Janies. I think it was. Yeah. I think it was at Cold Chimneys. Yeah. There's a question over. Yeah, I have, I suppose, a, a rhetorical question um, about the what, what you're calling the the uh, prayer journal. Um, underlining the difference, don't you think, between a journal? I'm a teach literature, and you have a great writer, and you read his journals, you read his correspondence, and all that. A journal and letters. You see, it's really not a prayer journal; it's a prayer correspondence. And that that is a generic difference. Uh, I mean, I, I teach literature. I had to read all these journals by writers. And a lot of them were good. A lot of them were totally mediocre. Uh, I don't find the prayer journal altogether that thrilling. But the idea, you see, that she's always writing to someone <coughs> um, whom she wants to believe in, uh, as opposed to a typical journal where the writer is just concerned totally with him or herself. Do you see what I mean? So, I mean, I really think there's an important generic distinction at the, let's say, f foothills of her career between um, letters to God and a writer's journal. Yes or no? I, I think that William Sessions um, would not have wanted it to be letters to God in the title. 
I, I, my impression is that that was his title, right? What? A prayer journal? A prayer journal yes. Yeah, that was his interpretation. Uh, I think you're right. I have two answers to your question, Jill. And the question was, what was the question? Why did she stop writing? Um, first of all, she was in grad school. She had too much work. <laughs> but seriously, um, the journal ends, I don't know if this is true or not, the journal ends, we don't have a definitive date. There's the story about where O'Connor um, visits the priest to talk about her writing. This is in 1947, so it's at the, it's during the prayer journal time. She's at Iowa. Um, Flannery consulted a priest about her writing. Was her subject matter scandalous? And the quote, she says to Gordon, he gave me one of those 10 cent pamphlets that they are never without, O'Connor later told Gordon, <laughs> and said, I didn't have to write for 15 year old girls. And this is what we, you and Dana were talking about the first day, this idea of permission. And so I wonder if permission is what she needed to. She didn't need the journal anymore. I don't know. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, this is a, a question I'd just like for you all to respond to, and it's the notion, I'll just project. Okay. It, of feeling, and it, all of you spoke a little bit about Flannery's struggle with feeling, and a, if I understood it correctly, her fear of sentimentality, you know, don't go there, don't go there, and intellectually holy, uh, but clearly her stories are full of feeling. I mean, they evoke feeling in the reader, to me. They're not sentimental. So I wonder if grappling with that as writers, what you think of that in terms of, in, in terms of dealing honestly with feeling? I mean, this, these aren't pure intellectual exercises that she's doing, right? There is feeling involved. So I wonder what your response is to her struggle with feeling and your struggle as authors with feeling. I have an anecdote. Um, I, I am Lutheran, and um, I work with a Lutheran choral music composer, Carl Schock. I, I do a lot of the lyrics for his, his choral music, and he asked me to write an Easter carol, and I did, and one of the lines was, um, Uh, feel, it, it changed, it, from feel the absence of Christ's presence to feel, feel ah, now I can't remember it, but I had, but anyway, Carl said to me, Jill, you're using a word Lutherans never use. <laughs> never talk about feeling. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, um, what she is responding against is that kind of, um, stirring up of a kind of false uh, feeling that sometimes certain sentimental religious songs or whatever can can do, you know. Um, I've seen a lot of that at Wheaton College, let me tell you. <laughs> so. But it's not a rejection of all feelings. No, no. And I don't think that she, she is against feeling. It's that, that, that faith doesn't depend upon emotion doesn't depend upon feeling but that yes you when you when you're writing you certainly do want the reader to feel you certainly do yeah and also a quotation that immediately comes to mind and when I you quote to my students writing students all the time is in Frost's the figure of home makes that little essay about writing he says no tears in the writer no tears in the reader no surprise in the writer no surprise in the reader and he also says, if you're writing a poem and you know what the end is before you get there, that's not a poem, that's a trick. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is this sense with Frost of, of totally investing yourself in this experience because a poem is an experience, writing a poem is an experience. Mm -hmm. um, he uses the image of an ice piece of ice on a hot stove and you have to follow it and you, you are 
feeling what it is that you're writing. I don't think O'Connor was that kind of writer. She was such a, um, and, and Frost was a reviser too, but she was just such a, a crafts person. Uh, and she went over and over and over things to get them just right. And I think, again, there's always this war between her head and her heart, and she always feels the right thing is for her head to win out. And and so I do think that in much of her life, she had a distrust of feeling. Um, and even when I think of things that happened in her life, for example, when she had the terrible breakup. Um, well, if, I don't know if you want to call it a breakup because they never really were officially a couple, but she was in love with Eric Langer. And um, and then when she realized that was not going to work out and he married someone else, nothing, it seems nothing is said of this in the house. And and Sally Fitzgerald asks later, her mother, Regina, well, you know, did she suffer? And, and Regina says, yes, she suffered terribly, but she didn't speak of it. Um, so there is, I think there was this sense in O'Connor of trying to always maintain control and not, you know, not lose it. And, and feeling was one of those, that, you know, she distrusted it because you do lose a sense of control. And in the craft of writing, the the rule is if you have something that's highly charged, highly emotional, you zoom out. You don't zoom in and show the tear dripping down the person. That That's sentimental. So... Um, one of the things Gordon writes to O'Connor is um, she says, you know, you're really good at slipping in and out of your characters, but I'd like to see you learn to do something else, to soar above the conflict, to view it as through the eyes of an eagle as cer at certain crucial moments. And that's what she's saying. Zoom out to the to the universal, not the it's almost like by backing away from the feeling you allow that to enter. And she says, um, you have, after all, you have a more exalted subject matter than any of the other young writers. Um, I'm sure you can do it, she says. I, actually, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Because that, that struck me, Joe, when you said in your paper that you, court, you were quoting O'Connor and you said that she said that we Catholics don't need to feel to know that grace is present. And so you, you sort of alluded to that a little bit just a moment ago about feelings, but it seems, and I understand, I, I get what Christine is saying, maybe this is kind of a question to all three of you since you all do creative writing, but it seems like in a story, the sacramentality is always wrapped up in some type of emotion, emotional investment on part of the reader in the story. Otherwise, why would we bother? I mean, it's what separates literature from, say, a philosophical conceptual exercise. So I'm just sort of wondering where... Does is can I mean it, does the grace does the depiction of grace in a story inevitably? Um, I don't even know what how, how he phrases the question. I'm just sort of when, when you write your own creative work, do you think about how grace how to wrap up your depictions if you do depictions of grace in the emotional character of the story, if that makes any sense. I don't, I'm not even quite sure what I'm asking. But, but I'm just really struck that it seems like the literature works in the exact opposite way of what O'Connor said Catholics supposedly know. I just wondered if you had some thoughts on that topic, either as a scholar of O'Connor or from a creative point of view. Um, I, in teaching creative writing, um, especially students who are taking creative writing for the first time, what I get a lot of from them, or what I used to get a lot of, are feelings poured out upon the page. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the importance of indirection, mm -hmm. and that that can speak much more loudly mm -hmm. than um, pouring out feelings like protoplasm or something. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and that's that's difficult to teach, but you teach it by, by t teaching them to penetrate concrete reality. And what is that mm -hmm. but sacramental? Mm -hmm. It's there are at least two different kinds of writers in the world. Um, I was just talking about Keats and Wordsworth, and I'm just reminded of Wordsworth's famous description of of what it is. To, what poetry is, it's the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling then recollected in tranquility. So there are at least two stages to writing a poem. There's the inspiration that you get, that the frost moment where you have tears or you have, um, you know, 
humor or, or whatever it is that motivates you to write the poem, and then you revise the poem. Then you step back from it and you make it into a work of art rather than the feelings spilled <laughs> out on the page. Um, it, it can start with that, the feeling spilled, but it's, it's got to go somewhere after that. Uh, and that's particularly true when you, uh, poets, I mean, speaking as a poet, poets often write of their own experience. Uh, and, and that's what I think is so interesting about O'Connor's choice to be a fiction writer. She wrote very few poems. She wrote a lot when she was a kid. She didn't write many as an adult. She sends one poem to, to F Sally Fitzgerald about Peacock, of course. And she writes, it is my one and only poem. I think it's a filthy habit for a fiction writer to get into. <laughs> And I think she did think it was a filthy habit, be partly because of this investment of feeling that comes with, and she's writing about something she loves, peacocks. Um, whereas if you are a third person narrator writing about characters that you are creating, you can maintain this distance. Um, and again, the, I, the image, uh, I just remembered, you know, the story behind or after the breakup with Eric Langer is when she writes Good Country People. Uh, and she writes that fast. She writes it in something like two weeks, two and a half weeks. And she usually is a very slow writer. And it's because she was able to channel her sorrow into these made up characters who, of course, are based on her and her mother, but they're not her and her mother. So she can maintain that distance and create this beautiful story because that was, I think, her way of being in the world. You know, that's how I'm going to control that set of feelings by writing the story and boy, does she get her revenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree with you about that process about the feeling and then the distance revision. And I agree with you about good country people too, but I would say that all of her work is extremely autobiographical and um, I can't defend that right now, but that's the way I've, um, I was so struck by um, Paul Schrader, the filmmaker talking about um, what is it called? Transcendental style. Transcendental. That to me, I was totally like, you got it. That's it. That's exactly it. That you, that you craft something to make a reader lean into it. And the way he described it is exactly what Tobias Wolf did in his reading where he had the kid about to splash into the puddle, but then he sort of spiraled off into all these other memories or, or actually the guy was in, in the, the son was saying dad. And then he recalled the son standing by the pub. He stopped time and he spiraled off. And that was what was making us lean in. So that's a really specific technique. And uh, O'Connor was absolutely in control of many of those techniques, I think. Yeah. We have time for one more. I know we started a little late, so I think we could be excused for doing one more. Okay, well then, um, let me just say two things real quick. Uh, for those of you who are interested, um, there is a mass at the, at the Madonna della Strada. If you go out the front of the building, the IC, just take a left, it's the building right over there. Uh, Deacon Ron Hansen will be the homeless. Second of all, if I can do a little shameless self promotion, we're actually sponsoring our own uh, conference at Sacred Heart University in April on the Catholic University 21st century. There's some flyers over there if you're interested. But can we please uh, give a round of applause for us? We want to hit that.